today's Thursday, June the 3rd, and I hope and pray you had a good night's rest and you're ready to go for the day. It's almost the last day of the week. Uh, boy, just really, really, really had a, had a very encouraging time last night in our corporate prayer. Um, man, I'm seeing the Lord grow us in our prayer and, and through our prayers together as corporately as a body. I'm I'm watching him, uh, watching him grow us together more in relationship through that prayer, and uh, man, I just love it. Uh, so I look forward to that first and foremost Wednesday every month. It's probably one of my favorite times of the month is to come together with the body in corporate prayer, and I'm encouraged by it. And I know others too. Uh, I want to ask you to continue to remember to pray for Constantine this morning. Um, just uh, some some complications or just a waiting test. Pray for Leah and Constantine as they continue to go through this trial uh, with cancer. And we're praying and believing and asking God to give a complete healing to Constantine. So lift up that family today. Send a note if you can. Um, just encourage them. A verse maybe you'll want to send to them that would be an encouragement to them. Well, this morning, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And I wanted to save that that portion of this passage for today and just to to deal with it because it really kind of stands alone in a sense when when Paul's writing this letter to those believers in Ephesus we can divide the book in, into two halves really the first half chapters one to three he just lays out there all of the rich doctrine related to our our completeness our oneness in Christ and the wonderful salvation that that God has brought to us and then in chapters 4, 5, and 6, he goes into, in a sense, applying that doctrine or the theology that he presents in the first three chapters into daily practical living, how we implement these in our lives. He talks about the family, he talks about their, our job, he talks about the unity in the body, um, and all of those areas of life rest on the theology that he lays out for us in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I've heard it said many times that people are not interested in theology. Well, <laughs> theology is the basis of the Christian living. What we believe about God, who God declares he is, who God uh, um, presents himself uh, to us, how he presents us. And in light of that, where are we in relationship to God? And so all of the Christian life rests on the bedrock of theology Theology just simply mean, means the study of God, who God is, his nature and his character. And so good theology, somebody has said, will always lead to right living. And so where our theology is skewed or is off, it's going to result in, in wrong living. Uh, so everything is based on the word of God and what he's revealed to us through his word. That's why we hold true and firm that this is God's inspired, infallible word. That it's not just, it's not that it just contains God word, God's word, but that it is God's word, inspired, given by the Holy Spirit, as men were directed and guided by the Holy Spirit to write his revelation of who he is and who we are in relationship to him. So Paul lays out this theology, and then at the close of this large stanza, if you will, in the first three chapters. Paul is reflecting back on all that he's already written to us. And he says this, now to him, um, we might skip the rest of verse 20 because it's kind of a continued thought and go to verse 21. Now to him, to, uh, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So Paul's concluding this and he's saying now to him, we want to give glory to him. Everything is about God's glory. Everything we do is about God's glory, not man's glory, not man's reveling in his, uh, his good works, not man reveling in his great accomplishments, but everything in the Christian life should be given to God for his glory. When someone is saved, when someone comes to know Christ, it's not, uh, it's not something that we can brag that we led somebody to Christ because nobody comes to God except God the Father draw him anyway, Jesus says. And so uh, when, when God saves someone, when God saved you and he saved me, he's glorified in that. He's given glory. So 
everything, everything that has breath, the psalmist said, let him praise the Lord. So everything is to give God glory. The question for my life and your life is, is what I'm doing, is what I'm saying, is what I'm uh, acting in, is what I'm serving in, are all of these things giving glory to God? Paul said in Galatians that whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, or excuse me, Colossians, do all to the glory of God. So everything that we do, we want to give God glory. And so he concludes this stanza by saying, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Now, this verse is oftentimes, almost most oftentimes, used out of context. Just like the verse in Philippians where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, and so we, we tend to pull this verse out and use it uh, in ways that, that that Paul did not intend when he was writing this. We use it in ways that, that we sometimes can, can claim that God's going to do great things, um, and that's not what Paul is saying here. What Paul is doing, Paul is reflecting back on all that he's written when he says to him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. Paul has in mind here, in, as he's writing this, that, that it was God who saved us and placed us in Christ, beginning back in first, uh, for, uh, chapter 1, that, that God has blessed us in Christ Jesus, that, that God chose us to be adopted as his own children, that God has predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters, that through the blood of Christ, his shed blood, God has redeemed us. God has purchased us out of the slave market, if you will, took us out of the market and then set us free. That God has, through the blood of Christ, God has forgiven us of all of our trespasses and our sins. He has, uh, again, redeemed us. He has given us all wisdom and insight. He's given us an inheritance in Christ Jesus. And in all of that, he says that he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And so Paul's thinking about all of these riches, and he says, man, only God could have done that. And in this verse 20, he says, to God be the glory who is able to do far and exceedingly more than what we could ever ask or imagine. We could never have asked or imagined how great God's salvation would be, is what Paul has in mind when he's here, writing here. Um, in this, he prays for them in chapter 1 that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and knowledge to know this great salvation, the riches of his glorious inheritance, his immeasurably great power. And then in chapter 2, he he's thinking of the fact that God has saved us by, by his grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And he hadn't saved us because of our works. None of our works could ever earn our salvation. So Paul has this in mind that that we could never work hard enough. We can never do enough right things to earn God's merit or to earn God's favor, to earn salvation. But God, by his grace, while we were yet dead in our trespasses, saved us in Christ Jesus. And then he goes into the next chapter in, in chapter two and starts talking about this idea that that he, uh, his plan of salvation not only included the circumcised, the Hebrew, but it also included the Gentiles, which you and I are a part of. And in Christ, he has broken down this wall of division that, that stands there. So there's neither Jew nor Greek, but we're all in Christ, all a part of the body of Christ. He speaks of God making peace through the blood of Christ, not peace among men, although that is a result and it happens, but the main thing is that through the blood of Christ, God has made peace with man. It's not that God made us his enemies, the Bible says, but we made God our enemies. And through Christ going to the cross, the wrath of God was poured out on him. The wrath that we deserved for sin, it was poured out on the sinless Son of God. And through the blood of Christ, we now have peace. No more hostility between us and God 
because of Jesus through the cross, his shed blood on the cross, and he's made peace in that. That one time we were aliens, but now we are part of the kingdom of God through Christ. Then in chapter 3, as we've looked the last couple of days, he speaks of this mystery, the church, the body of Christ, which we are the bride of Christ. So it's in all of this that Paul is looking back. And he says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power, the dunamis, the dynamite that is working in us by the Holy Spirit of God. To him be glory in the church, in the body of Christ, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And Paul reflects, and we need to reflect back today on all that Paul has, has said to us in the first three chapters all that Christ has done for us, all that he has provided for us in that way of salvation, that if God is able to save a wretch like me, and he's able to save a wretch like you, to not just clean up our life, that's not faith. That's not being born again. Cleaning up our life is is, is a matter of works. It's, it's a religious spirit. But Christ has transformed us that we are a new creation in Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Only God can do that. And so Paul is saying, listen, if he can do that, there's so much more that he can do. The greatest miracle that God ever performs is that he saves a wretched sinner like you and like me. And today we want to give him the glory for that. There's an old song that came to my mind as I was meditating on these two verses and just meditating on these old truths. And that is that we have victory in Jesus, victory over sin and death, the eternal death that before we were saved, we were destined for an eternity in hell, separated from God. But now through Christ, we have the promise and the hope of the resurrection and an eternal life with him. I pray that the rest of the day, we'll just have this in our minds, meditate on it, give God the glory. Think all day today about the rich salvation. Take time this morning to go back and read through again the first three chapters. And if it doesn't lead you to praise him, then something's wrong with your praiser. Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning And I repented of my sin
spend the rest of the day just praising God, giving him glory for all the breath that he's given us and the eternal salvation he's given to us in Christ Jesus. I pray the Lord blesses you today. I pray you have a good weekend. Look forward to being with you on Sunday morning in our corporate worship time at 10 a.m. Uh, encourage you to be a part of a small group, either our 815 groups or our 11 o'clock groups, or excuse me, 1115 groups. Um, Connect with one another, love one another, pray for one another. Ask God to give you an opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart today or to cultivate a seed that's already been planted there. Or if God, by his grace, would allow us to participate in watching him save somebody, would God do that? I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you and that he'd keep you. Have a great day.